We are now 250 years into this story, and the cost of living is still roughly the same as it was at the start. I invite you to think about that for a minute. But then another war came along, and this one was even bigger than any before, and again it was a highly inflationary event. And then another war, even bigger than any before it, which again proved inflationary, but this time, something odd happened. Inflation did not retreat before the next war began. Why? Two reasons. First, the country was no longer on a gold standard, but instead a fiat paper standard, administered by the Federal Reserve, and the populace did not have another form of currency to which it could turn. And second, because this was the first time that the war apparatus was not dismantled upon conclusion of hostilities. Instead, full mobilization was maintained and a protracted Cold War was fought, certainly as inflationary a conflict as any shooting war ever was. And now, if we look at the entire sweep of history, we can make an utterly obvious conclusion. All wars are inflationary. Why is this? Because any time the government engages in deficit spending, it creates the conditions for inflation. However, when the deficit spending is on legitimate infrastructure, such as roads or bridges or schools, that investment will slowly pay for itself by boosting productivity and paving the way for the creation of additional goods and services that will someday soak up the extra cash. Wars, however, are special. Vast quantities of money are spent on things that are meant to be blown up. The money stays at home while the goods get sent off to be blown up. When a bomb blows up, there's no residual benefit to the domestic economy later on. This means war spending is the most inflationary of all spending. It's a double whammy. The money stays behind working its evil magic while the goods it produced are destroyed. Heck, even if the goods aren't blown up, there's practically zero residual economic benefit to such specialized hardware, as amazing as that technology may be. For some reason, the most recent pair of wars have been presented by the U.S. mainstream press as being relatively pain-free for the average citizen, despite overwhelming historical odds to the contrary. In fact, on this 15-year-long chart of commodity prices, we observe that prices bounced in a channel, marked by the green lines, for more than 10 years. However, and hopefully by now unsurprisingly, shortly after the start of the Iraq War, commodity prices began marching higher and have inflated nearly 140% in five years. Your gasoline and food bills will confirm this. So if anybody tries to tell you that you haven't sacrificed for the war, let them know you sacrificed a large portion of your savings and your paycheck to the effort. Thank you very much. At any rate, back to our main story. Here's inflation between 1665 and 1975. Knowing what you now know about Nixon's actions on August 15, 1971, what do you suppose the rest of the graph looks like between 1975 and today? This is your world. You've been living on the steeply rising portion of this graph for so long that it probably looks like level ground to you. Because inflation is now a permanent feature, and because it advances at a percentage rate, your money is declining in value exponentially. That's what this hockey stick graph is telling you. What does it mean to live in a world where your money loses value exponentially? You know what it means, because you live there. It means always having to work harder and harder just to stay in place. And it means perplexing and astoundingly risky investment decisions have to be made in an attempt to grow one's savings fast enough to avoid the ravages of inflation. It means two incomes are needed where one used to suffice and kids left at home while both parents work. A world of constantly eroding money is a devilishly complicated world to navigate and leaves scant room for error, especially for those without the appropriate means or connections. And it doesn't have to be this way, and indeed for the majority of our country's history, as you can see, it wasn't. And I'm hard-pressed to say that inflation is a necessity and serves some essential and greater good because a lot of progress and advancement happened between 1665 and 1940 without the benefit of perpetual inflation. To help put all of this in context, let's mark the moments when our country abandoned the gold standard, first internally and then completely. It may have surprised some of you, as it did me, to find out that inflation is not a mysterious law of nature like gravity, but rather an extremely well-characterized matter of policy. So now we have our fifth key concept. Inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. Flipped a bit, we can say that inflation is a deliberate act of policy. Here's what one wag had to say about this matter. Paper money eventually returns to its intrinsic value. Zero. That was Voltaire in 1729. Of course, he was a bit too pessimistic in his assessment as this German woman proves by using her furnace to liberate the intrinsic heat content of paper money. 
John Maynard Keynes, the father of the branch of economics that utterly dominates our lives, had this to say about inflation. Lenin was certainly right. There is no more positive or subtle or sure means of destroying the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. By a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate, secretly and unobserved, an important part of the wealth of the citizens. The process engages all of the hidden forces of economics on the side of destruction and does it in a manner that not one man in a million can diagnose. Given that the destructive, corrosive effects of inflation are so well understood by the architects and the administrators of our monetary system, it's fair to wonder exactly what the plan here is. Now, finally, here in Chapter 10 of the Crash Course, we can string together these three very important dots. Number one, in 1971, the U.S., and by extension the world, terminated the last connection to a gold restraint and federal borrowing turned the corner never to look back. Concurrently, the money supply turned the corner, piling up at a much faster rate than the growth of goods and services. And so we get to data point number three, which is that inflation is the fully predictable outcome of data points one and two. Boom, boom, boom. One, two, three. All connected, all saying the same thing, with profound implications for your future. Now, if you're of a mind that there's no reason that all three of these graphs cannot just continue to exponentially accelerate, to ever higher amounts without end, then there's no point in watching the rest of the crash course. However, if you don't happen to believe that, then you're going to want to see the rest of this.